You can't do enough. You can't be stupid enough to overcome God's redemptive power. Like you're not, you're not that strong. And if God has made that decision, then what are you going to do to undo that decision? College Podcast with your speaker, Pastor Taylor Gap. I have a temper, if you are unaware. Um, I don't think many of you have been super fortunate enough to like see it, but um, it's there. Um, and I, what one thing that I've discovered over years of having that temper is that uh, it comes out actually more at myself than at anybody else, right? So like, I actually end up being angry at me more than I'm angry at other people. Um, really what it is, is that if something is like totally out of my control, like if it crosses that line of not, like I can't just make it different, then it's easy for me to kind of slough it off and just be like, well, you know, I, I can't really do anything about that, right? So that pretty much encompasses anything that's not my own fault, right? Uh, but then as soon as it's like, in my control, as soon as it's something I could have or should have fixed or made different, that's when I'm going to get angry. Um, The smallest version of this that's like has an outsized response is uh, if I miss a turn on the highway. Like if I miss my exit, that's like, that's going to be a bad day. Um, (laughs) And like I, I wish that this was not accurate, but I, I will actually lose my temper over driving past an exit. And it only happens, right, when I'm the one driving, right? Because I should have not missed that turn. Like, I shouldn't have, you know, I should have paid attention better or whatever, and I shouldn't have missed that turn and wasted my own time. It, it doesn't happen when, like, anybody else is driving, which, in you know, would be kind of weird, right? If I was just, like, sitting in shotgun and we missed a, high, a turn on the highway, and I was like, you are an idiot, right? Like, <laughs> that would be kind of weird. So that that doesn't typically elicit that same response i'm i'm more angry at myself (laughs) really what this is though is it's a it's a symptom it's a symptom of how much trust i have uh in god or or not how much but more like the kind of trust i have in god so think about it like this i trust god absolutely to save me eternally like of course i do What hope do I have outside of God doing that, saving me in that eternal way? But right here, right now, I'm responsible for this. Like, I'm the one that's got to handle my day in, day out. God's just got the the big picture, right? But isn't that kind of backwards? Like, think about it. Think about it like this. I trust God to do the single most difficult and impossible task in all of human history to bring me to himself after I have lived a life in sin, right? Like, that's, that should be impossible. And I trust God to do this absolutely impossible eternal act, but he's like somehow incapable of handling all the little stuff, all the lesser than that type stuff. Like, that doesn't even make sense. If God is capable and willing to do the single greatest thing that can ever be done, why would I then think he's either not capable or not willing to take care of me in every other aspect of my life. As a matter of fact, when I think about it like that, it's the every other aspects of my life that God is taking care of to show me, to build the credibility that he is in fact going to do the big one, the impossible one, right? That's what, that's what he's, he's showing off, right? He's not like, well, you know, I got the big one, so I guess suck it up for the rest of your life. No, he's actually actively showing me in every little thing, I've got you and you know because of all my credibility with you, that I've got you when it comes to the big thing, the one that you can't possibly achieve on your own, right? So last week we saw the call of Abraham, and I showed you that Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So what is Abraham doing in that moment? He's trusting in God for the eternity, right? He's saying God has got the big things that are out of my control, the eternal implications, and he begins to worship God and call on God for 
his redemption, for his eternity, right? So he has turned himself, oriented himself towards God being his Savior. That's what happened last week with Abraham. And then he's immediately going to give, uh, he, he, in that moment, he gave up his temporal assurance. Like, what did he have, right? He had an inheritance coming, he had a family, he had safety and security. He gave up all of that for this eternal assurance, right? For, for the fact that God was giving him something that was going to go beyond even life, right? But this week, we're going to have a, a temporal problem, and Abraham is immediately going to solve it for himself. He's immediately not going to put this into God's hands. He's not going to say, well, God already promised me that he's going to take care of me eternally, so why would I have to worry? He's going to go, uh-oh, I, you know, I know I'm following God for all those you know, saving moments that he's going to perform in, in, in eternity, but I've got to handle this one right here, right now. There's something important to notice about this story. It's that there's a cycle that we've already seen developing. It's been more and more clear, and it's going to crystallize right here in Abraham's story. And then it's going to continue to expand all the way to Jesus. Okay, There is a cycle for redemption. It is humans taking matters into their own hands, determining that, that they're going to do what God should be the one doing, or they're going to do it their way, Things don't go well, God intervenes, and then God brings us back to himself. That's the cycle. We saw it in Eden. We saw it attempted with Cain. We saw it with Noah. It's been getting clearer that every time humans are acting on their own accord, away from God, things go badly, and then God finds a way to redeem it and to bring people back to himself. Right? And so it's going to get even bigger. It's going to get more and more elaborate, but right here at the end of chapter 12, we're going to see it kind of encapsulated like a almost like a model that then we're going to be shown over and over again through the Old Testament. So something you're going to notice today, and I'm, I'm going to point out to you, is the first half of this story in, in the end of chapter 12, it is a verbatim uh, setup of what happens with Joseph and his brothers where they sell him into Egypt, and then eventually he climbs to being the second most powerful, and they come to Egypt because of a famine, right? Like, that whole story, we're going to see that in the first half of Abraham's story here. And then, Moses' story at the beginning of the Exodus, which is that the people are freed, they're enslaved in Egypt, and then they walk out of Egypt, they are freed from Egypt, and they plunder Egypt. That's going to be the second half of the story. So you're going to see, like I'm saying, this is an encapsulated version, and then when we get to Joseph... The first half of this Abraham story is just the whole the whole life of Joseph. And then the second half of this Abraham story is the whole point and story of the Exodus happening, right? So it is getting more and more elaborate because God is showing us redemption from the earliest pages of Genesis. He's showing us redemption in a clearer and clearer fashion all the way until one day it is crystal clear in the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Because all of human history has been trying to do things their own way apart from God. Things didn't go well, and then Jesus has to redeem us and bring us back to God, right? So that same story is the cycle of the Bible over and over and over again. And, and what that cycle shows us is this. God has decided to save, and there's nothing we can do to mess that up. We cannot overcome God's decision to redeem. One of our worst habits as humans is not that we make mistakes, it's that we double down on our mistakes. Right? Like we make bad choices or we live certain lifestyle choices out and no matter how much God tries to get our attention, no matter how much God tries to to discipline us and bring us back to himself, we double down in our sin. We say, "No, no, no. I if I just do it a little bit more, if I just do it this way, it'll work." Right? I'll It'll pan out for me correctly. We double down in the stupid decisions we make. Look with me at Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a time because the famine was severe in the land. Okay, stop right there. So Abram has just been called by God. That's what we saw in verses 1 through 9. He has just seen God 
uh, personally, like God has appeared to him. He has worshipped God. He is trusting in God for eternity. And what do we see? He's in the promised land where he's supposed to be, the place that God has promised him, and there's a famine. Right, right off the bat, there is a trial that's going to test his faith. And as he sees this trial, he it, I want you to see, first of all, that this trial is a real problem. It's not a fake, famine's not, like, he didn't imagine this problem up, right? Like, this isn't anxiety, this is real world, he's in trouble. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't seek God. He doesn't immediately go to God and trust in God. He decides that he's going to go to Egypt and he's going to find uh, physical help. In Isaiah 31, uh, verse 1, it says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Right. So we're told in the Bible over and over again, before you rely... Now, like this is where things get tricky, right? Uh, what I'm not telling you to do is not take medicine, right? Like that that's silly, right? If you get a cold, take some cold medicine. No problem with that. What I'm saying is, in addition to the cold medicine, you need to spend time in prayer, right? You need to ask the Lord for something. You can see it even bigger, you know, say you get cancer. I'm not saying don't go through the surgery, don't get the chemotherapy, but I'm saying if you're depending solely in the physical means and you're not going to the Lord and saying, Lord, you know, none of this is going to be successful without you, without your will, without your desire for it to be successful, you've already missed the point, right? And then there's the, the opposite of that, right? Like, it's not trusting in God just to go, Lord, just miraculously remove the cancer and then never take the steps that he has provided for you to physically heal, right? Now, there's a balancing act in there, Good luck finding it, right? That's like that's the whole point. That's what faith is. It's walking in that in that tension in that middle ground. But the point is, it's not an either or, right? But Abraham misses one whole aspect. He doesn't seek the Lord. He does not. He relies completely on physical means. Now, I want you to see something here. There is I always try to point out to you guys the writing that we would otherwise miss in in uh, Genesis because ancient Near Eastern writers, they did some things uh, in authoring the stories that we we don't naturally see. So one of the things I want you to notice is it says that when he goes to Egypt, that he went down to Egypt. Now that, that physically is, you know, if you're looking at a map, he went kind of a southwestern direction, right? So it looks on a map like he's going down. That's not actually the point. See, because I'm going to foreshadow when we get to uh 13 1 13 1 is going to say he went up right so the idea is not only that he went south in one point and north in another point but it's bracketing the story and there's a chiasm that's going to form now i told you guys about a chiasm when we talked about babel a chiasm is where the first verse and the last verse of the story match and the second verse and the second to last verse match, so on and so forth, until you have this centerpiece, and that's what you're supposed to focus on. So the chiasm here is the same. Things in this story are going down until you hit this center point where God intervenes personally, and then the story ends because of God's intervention with things going up. So that bracket is intentional because that's a literary device designed to show us that things were going one direction and it took God getting involved personally for things to go the right direction, for things to go back up. So we see that, uh, that that's there. Um, he doesn't seek God. I want you to see something like there is a, um, a spiritualized way to look at, at every text and you've got to be careful with that because you can get out of bounds with what the scripture is showing you. But we have famines spiritually in our life, do we not? Like there's times when you're reading the Bible and it, it feels like you can't get anything, right? Like you're not able to receive from God. But here's the deal. Majority of the time that we can't hear from God, I really think it's just because we're not seeking God. I mean, a lot of times, and, and I'm not saying you're not opening the book up, right? But you can open the book up and not have your heart postured in a way where you are seeking the Lord. So... I would encourage you, if you are walking through a spiritual famine, ask yourself where the dry spell is. Because God is not refusing to talk. 
but you might be refusing to listen. So in this moment, Abraham, Abram is not seeking the Lord, so he's not getting anything from God. All right, look at verse 11. It came about when he was approaching Egypt that he said to his wife Sarai, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is my wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, so that it will go well for me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Okay, first of all, I want to point out that Sarai is 65 in this story. Um, so that caught me off guard a little bit. I was like, man, she uh, must be keeping up with her cardio routine or something because she's 65 and she's turning heads, right? But <laughs> there's, there was two things I read that, that made this make more sense. One of them I don't actually put a lot of stock into. It was said that given the long lives at this time period, like, Technically, she's about middle-aged, which isn't an unfair way to do it. I'm not sure that that's what's happening exactly. I think that um, a more probably uh, realistic explanation is that standards of beauty are based around different culturally specific things. And at this point in this uh, part of the world, beauty was based around eyes, like actually having like beautiful eyes and form. So... Uh, if she she's a nomad, if she's lived a, a rough life where she is, uh, you know, in whatever shape right that they that they prized because that changes with cultures too, and she also is has beautiful eyes, she would have considered a, a trophy right regardless of uh, her age right. Her age wouldn't have ha- wouldn't have changed that she was considered to have met whatever standard of beauty was in their culture. Okay, so. She is a beautiful woman. Um, Abraham, I want you to notice, I said that the famine was a real problem. But this, although this is not outside the realm of possibility, this is actually a made-up problem. Abraham is now imagining things that can go wrong. Right? He has said, well, this might happen when we get there. This really bad thing could go wrong. This is anxiety. This is exactly what we do all the time, is dreaming up problems that are in front of us. I heard somebody say recently a a quote that I I can't get out of my head. They said, anxiety is racing into the future devoid of God's grace. See, what happens when you're anxious is that you're thinking of your future and all the things, all the problems that you might have or will have that you can't solve, and you're forgetting that God is the one solving all your problems now. He's the one giving you the grace to to make it through the day each day, and he will still be there when you get to those future problems. That's the the part of the cure for anxiety. And again, I'm not taking away from you that there are medical versions of anxiety and there are medicines that help us with that. But but the bottom line is some of you struggle with just your average run-of-the-mill not trusting in God with your future problem. It's not the medical condition of anxiety. It's purely a lack of faith. And that's what Abram is is facing right now. He trusts God eternally, but not temporally. So then he comes up with a plan. Now, if you look at it, uh, Sarai is actually his half-sister. And so on the one hand, he's what is he doing, right? We talk about this all the time. He's twisting the truth, right? And every time we see the truth get twisted, it's hard not to to jump back to the first time the truth was ever twisted and who was doing it, right? In Genesis chapter 3, we saw that the serpent twists God's truth. And so the writer, there's there's arguments over whether or not what Abram does right here is bad. Like, maybe it makes sense. Seems like it works out for him as we keep going. It, it does look like he benefits from it. But for starters, he's twisting the truth. So we're already off to a bad start before we even notice what's going to happen next. So uh, he acknowledges that his life is in her hands. He says, so that I may live, so that it may go well for me according to you, right? So he is acknowledging that what happens to him is based on what happens with his wife. She has become the source of of how things are going to go for him in Egypt. There is an accusation in in our day and time, in our world, that the Bible is sexist, right? It's oppressive towards women. It's a It's a tool of the patriarchy, right? I want you to see something. Um, Sarai is, she's silent during this story, right? We don't see whether she agrees to this. 
We don't see, and it, and really in that time period doesn't matter because she was a property that she was owned. But I want you to see something. The Bible continually goes out of its way to show that mistreating women is wrong. And in this moment, God is going to intervene, and we're going to see God is going to intervene on her behalf, not on Abram's behalf. He's going to intervene on her behalf. He's going to protect her because she is the one that can't speak up for herself. She is the one in this time period that cannot defend herself, and God is going to rush in and protect her. And Abram is going to get rebuked for what he has done wrong here. See, the Bible is constantly going out of its way to protect women and to show men that there's a right way to treat women, right? So the Bible, especially for its given time period, was actually the, and it was the feminist option, right? This was the book justifying that you don't mistreat women, right? And so that's important for us to, to understand. Um, God is not only going to um, protect Sarai, but he's going to use her specifically as the tool to deliver and bless Abram. God, God is going to intervene on her behalf and using her. So I want you to notice the parallel so far. In Eve, uh, in Eden, in Eve, she tries to handle things her own way, right? Cain, he his sacrifice isn't accepted, so he's going to take matters into his own hands. The people in those days, they're living according to however they see fit. Uh, Babel is a story where people said, we want to get to heaven our own way. We're going to build a tower for ourselves, right? Every story so far in this cycle, we've seen the starting point of people acting on their own behalf to save themselves, to work out things their own way without asking God. That's where we are with Abram. Right now, he's already doing what we've already seen over and over and over again. The current audience, uh, the other parallel is the current, current audience is wandering around in numbers, right? They're in the wilderness. They just came out of Egypt. How did they get into Egypt? They went to Egypt as a family, because there was famine in the promised land. So they are seeing the same parallel of their patriarch has moved into Egypt because of famine. And Abram is going to be saved on account of a member of his family that is taken essentially prisoner or put into slavery in Egypt the same way that Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt and saves his family. Right? So God is repeating himself, right? Um, I, I want you to see something about this repetition. This repetition is designed to show you that God has decided that there is a way redemption is going to unfold. He decided it in the Garden of Eden, and it once God decides something, it's settled. It will happen, right? So the, the reality is the cycle that starts in Eden when God sends them out and, and begins the process of redeeming them to himself. He decided this is how redemption is going to go, and it happens over and over and over and over again in the Bible to emphasize God already said this is how it's going to work. God already, God already said this is how he's going to redeem people, and so it never stops happening. It's con he's continually redeeming people by this same method of we mess up, things go badly, he intervenes, brings us back to himself. That is the cycle. And that cycle is never going to be stopped because God has decided. And, and we can't be, you can't do enough. You can't be stupid enough to overcome God's redemptive power. Like you're not, you're not that strong. And if God has made that decision, then what are you going to do to undo that decision? Right? This is why... Uh, this is the beginning of the doctrine of why we believe that we can't lose our salvation. Because there is, once God has decided that you're his child, how are you going to undo that? What, what, if, what sin of yours is going to be so strong and so powerful that God is going to go, oh, well, that, that's going to overcome my love and mercy and grace and then cut you loose? That's not how it works. The repetition is intentional. But we would miss out if God didn't act in our lives. So Babel had this chiasm, right? So this chiasm that goes down until God intervenes and then the story reverses itself. So the same thing is happening right here, right? So we're about to see the portion where God is going to intervene 
and the story is going to uh, move in a different direction. Look at verse 14. Now it came about when Abram entered Egypt that the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore he treated Abram well for her sake. And he gave him sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So, he, he, she is taken into Pharaoh's house. And I want you to see that this, that taking her into um, Pharaoh's house, that is the mistreatment. That is the slavery. Like, Pharaoh's basically, like, snapped his fingers and said, I want her. And she was brought to him, right? So, she's now in his harem in his, you know, kind of this house where he keeps his wives, and she has essentially been taken captive, right? So she is now being, and what this is, right, this is mistreating Abram, mistreating God's chosen man and his family, right? Now, um, we, we've already seen that God told, God told Abram, I will curse those who curse you. And I told you last week when we saw that, that the spiritual explanation of that is essentially that those who blow off the blessing of Abraham, which is eventually the Messiah, Jesus Christ, those who blow that off receive the curse. What is the curse? Not getting the Messiah, right? Like that, it's this almost default setting, right? When you blow off the blessings that God offered through Abraham that come about in Jesus Christ, you don't receive them, which is the curse. But here's the beautiful thing about God. When God says something, he doesn't, he doesn't isolate what he has said to only the singular uh, definition. He doesn't go, God never goes, well, that, I didn't, that wasn't my point. My point was this. No, when God says something, he fulfills it in every version of itself. He fulfills it in every way perfectly, right? So even though that curse was meant to be a statement of you will miss out on God if you're not following the God that Abraham followed, right? Even though that statement had a spiritualized aspect of it, God is going to fulfill that by cursing everybody who curses Abram or his family in any form. And mistreating Abram's wife and Abram, it fits right into that category of cursing, right? So in this moment, Abram has just been the, uh, or Pharaoh has just been the first person to test God's statement that I will curse those who curse you. And he's about to be the one that that reaps God's fulfillment of that promise. Now, at first, I couldn't I couldn't really understand this at first. He, we had this list of uh, animals and servants that, that he takes in. Now, there's no significance to the order. At first, I thought like, why are they listed the way they're listed? Um, but the thing I read basically said uh, this is probably the order of acquisition, like. He would have gotten so much of something that then he would have needed more servants to help him, and then he got more servants, and then you know it's like almost like a a wealth. Uh, it's like the the way that building your wealth made sense in the in ancient Near East. So it's it's not that there's an order of priority like well, you know, male servants are less important than male donkeys. You know, like that's not what's happening here, right? But but it still didn't make sense to me because he is he's benefiting, like he gives up Sarai, he doesn't die, which is what he thought was going to happen, and he's getting rich, right? He's, he's being showered with stuff, right? And at first I'm like, why, you know, the, the Bible's really big on outcomes, or the Old Testament is really big on outcomes. Like, the outcome shows us if the action was moral a lot of times. They don't, they don't come out and say this was bad. They just show you really bad things happening afterwards. And they're like, do you see why it was bad, right? And so I was confused until it, it struck me what's happening here. Abram is trading eternal assurance for temporary things. He's giving away the promise of God that can only be fulfilled through his wife for some stuff that he can have. It's not going well for him. He's benefiting in a worldly way. This is literally what being like a celebrity in our day and time is. As people who are giving up all of the eternal because they're, they, they want to get more stuff. They want to get rich. They want to get famous. They want to get powerful. They want more things right here, right now. And they're trading away their eternity for the sake of their, the immediate. Right? So this is, not, this is not supposed to look good for him because what happens if God doesn't intervene? Sure, he gets rich, 
But he dies out and he misses out on all the promises that God has offered him, all the eternal promises that God has taught him or uh, offered him. And so he is missing out in this moment. So then look at, look at verse 17. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now, I want you to see there's this common phrase, right, that we always look for in the Bible, and it's in a couple places it's, it's actually, but God, right? And what follows but God? Redemption. All, every time. Every time there's a but God acted, there's a redemptive act coming. God intervenes to save and to redeem. This is no different, right? This is but the Lord, right? This is an Old Testament version of God's going to intervene and his action is going to bring about redemption. It's going to save. So he acts on Sarai's behalf and God, and, and here's the thing. God uses the whole situation, all of Abram's bad actions up to this point. As soon as God gets involved, he uses those actions to bless him. Like, Abram does end up becoming even more wealthy. We're going to see, uh, literally moving into chapter 13, that he's so wealthy that he and Lot can't even fit in the same space because they have so much stuff, right? So God did, in fact, bless Abram through this story. But you know what that tells me? That doesn't tell me Abraham did a good thing. That tells me that God choosing to bless you is not based on your merit, God's decision to bless Abraham, it's something he chose, he decided, and Abram wasn't going to mess that up even though he's trying awfully hard. He doesn't manage to defeat what God is doing in his life. God's decision to redeem is not dependent on our actions or our merits. But if God doesn't act, we will miss out. And what do we see? That we, we see the parallel still moving. God intervened in the Garden of Eden to set things right so that humans could be redeemed. He intervened with Cain, right? And even though, well, how did he intervene with Cain? Cain doesn't benefit. Cain misses out because Cain goes away from God. But Seth comes about. God intervenes and brings about another son to carry the seed. We see that God intervened with Noah to save people, to save humankind from the flood. God intervened in Babel so that his will be fruitful and multiply would continue. God is going to intervene when Israel is enslaved in Egypt. And eventually God is going to send Jesus to reverse the damning course of human nature. All of human history headed downhill, headed to the same bad end. At our own hand, and God is going to send His Savior to intervene. God made the decision to redeem in Eden, and it's marching forward one generation at a time until the day it meets Jesus Christ. And that decision to redeem is marching now forward in the church, one generation at a time, through believers. And it will continue to march forward, and it will continue to save people until the day the Lord returns. God's intervention takes a story that's spiraling down, whether in the Bible or your own story, your own life, as it spirals. God's intervention takes a story that's spiraling down, and He takes it back to Himself. You know that God uses all trials, even your own mess-ups? He uses all those things to sanctify you, to make you more like Him, and to bring you back into His will. Look at verse 18. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that, that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for myself as a wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men, men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. So God intervenes, and I want you to see something. Pharaoh is now speaking on God's behalf. Pharaoh begins to actually mimic things that God has already told Abram. So he rebukes Abram. That's the first thing that happens. So he's speaking for God in rebuking Abram for his actions. And then I want you to see that this thing that started as a failure to love God, Abraham failed to love God. He failed to trust in the Lord and have faith. That failure to love God became a failure to love others. Why? Because he put himself ahead of his wife 
and ahead of everybody in Egypt because now Pharaoh and his household, they're suffering it, They inadvertently. They're suffering and they didn't even know what was going on, but that's because Abraham didn't love them. He didn't love on them. He didn't point them to God and say, hey, you know, uh, like, don't you can't hurt me because God loves me and you should follow this God too. He just hid. He just handled things himself. He he twisted the truth. He added deception in there. And now other people are suffering because of his actions. So this failure to love God became a failure to love others. And now he's being rebuked by others on God's behalf. I want to read uh, a, a portion of a psalm. Now this psalm is written specifically to Israel as they have come out of Egypt. But I want you to see the, the, the cycle, right? the cycle that, that is happening all the time in the Bible that uh, how much of this applies to Abram right now in this situation. So the psalm is Psalm 105. It is titled, The Lord's Wonderful Works on Behalf of Israel. And starting in verse 8, it says, He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. Then he confirmed it to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as a portion of your inheritance, when they were only a few people in number, very few, and strangers in it. And they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, He allowed no one to oppress them, and he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do not harm my prophets. And he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They forced his feet into shackles. He was put into irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord refined him. The king set and released him, the rulers of peoples, and set him free. He made him the lord of the house and ruler over his possessions to imprison his high officials at will that he might teach his elders wisdom. See how much of that story, like how many stories did we just touch? Right, we touched Joseph's story, we touched Jacob's story and Isaac's story, we touched Abraham right here. We, we, we talked about people being enslaved in Egypt, which we see happen twice. We talked about people, uh, God commanding don't touch my anointed ones. Don't curse them, right? Like how much of that psalm appears over and over and over again? Why? Because there's a cycle of redemption that God decided in Eden, and it's playing out in your lives. That same cycle. See, when you say God's going to save me in eternity, but I got to handle right now, you have failed to look for the cycle of redemption that is, yes, going to play out in an eternal way in your life, but it's also playing out in the specific troubles that you have on a daily basis. That doesn't mean that there's no real problems. There was a famine. Abram had a real problem. But God was going to handle it. God was going to provide for him. Instead, Abram tries to, to handle it himself ends up inventing more problems and making the situation worse. And only because God had already decided on his behalf does it all work out. God decided that he was going to bless Abram. God decided that he was going to intervene on his behalf. And because of that, there's blessings in this moment. But Abram, even though he does get blessed, he's also rebuked. He's also scolded and chastised because he took matters into his own hand. Are you looking for God's redemption, not just in your eternity, but in your immediate vicinity? Is God redeeming you day in and day out? Verse 19, Pharaoh speaking to the Lord, he says, Go, go from me. Just like the Lord looked at Adam and Eve in the garden and said, Leave, you have to go. You can't be here anymore. So he is speaking on God's behalf. But here's the here's the thing. In Eve, in Eden, God cast them out away from his presence. In this moment, God is using Pharaoh to cast them out back into the Lord's presence. See, because that's what redemption is. It's that the original problem is that we fell and God had to cast us out from him. And redemption is that now God is constantly trying to get us back to him. So when he says go, he's no longer saying go from me. He's saying go from sin, go from your mistakes, go from your bad decisions back to where I am. 
back to where you should be with me. In verse 20, they are forced to leave Egypt, just like Adam and Eve were forced to leave the garden, and just like the Israelites will eventually be forced to leave in the Exodus. Right? Again, this cycle of redemption is constant. It is, it is wrapping around over and over again. Here's the thing. Adam and Eve leave Eden empty-handed. But in this moment, Abram is going to leave Egypt having plundered it. And what do we know? Again, the current audience, they're walking around in, in numbers. They, ha- they just left Egypt and they plundered Egypt as well. right? Because God is acting on behalf of His children and defeating His enemies all at the same time, over and over and over again. That's what redemption is. Look at, look at 13 verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. So we end this story going up, back to where, and here's the thing, where do they end up? They end up in the Negev. Look at verse 9. Then Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. He's back where he started. He's back where he should have been the whole time. He basically took a giant detour out of what God had for him, ideally, just to trust in him and be where he was supposed to be. And God has redeemed this. God has used it for his purposes. But Abram is right back where he started. He's right back to the exact place where he should have been. Guys, my 20s were basically a giant sojourn into Egypt. Just a waste of my... Now, what was God doing? Did God Has God redeemed that time? Of course he has. Because he loves me. Not because I deserve for the, that time to be redeemed. But God uses that experience in my 20s to give me the experiences and the, the now, you know, hard-earned wisdom to, to say, hey, don't do that. Don't live like that. But, you know, sometimes I wonder what my life would have been if I had just gotten on board with what God was doing in my life at the start. It would have been a lot less painful, I can tell you that. God will redeem your story. He will make right even your own stupid mistakes. That's actually where you get to rest in. You can't mess it up so bad he can't fix it, right? But does that mean you just run face first into every brick wall you find? Like, God will take care of it. It'll be fine. Like, no. Like, get on board with what God is doing. Look for this redemption. God's plan to redeem you and to move redemption forward in your life. I talk to you guys all the time about like this idea that that you're too you're too bad, you're too far gone. Like God can't save you because you've done too many bad things. You, you, what you're doing in that in that mentality is you're promoting your sin above God's love. Like that, like a- actively, I shouldn't have to even explain that. As soon as I say that out loud, you should be like, "Yeah, that's dumb." Right? That that is a silly thing to do. If God can eternally save you, there's nothing you can do to get outside of that. And He can also save you in the moment. He can pay your bills. He can handle your loneliness. He can diffuse your anxiety. He can can be with you and walking through your health situations. Like God is involved, whether it's family issues, loss. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what each and every one of you is going through individually at, at any given moment. But I know that if, if you are a child of the living God and He has said, I have you eternally, He doesn't have you eternally to forsake you temporally. That's not how it works. The most freedom I have ever found in my life is when I begin to live what I actually believe, which is that God is able and willing to act in my life, to save me, to pay my bills and meet my needs, to use my life and give it meaning. That's honestly the, like, you could get rich and powerful and famous and your life mean nothing. Why would you want that? And like, that's what Abraham was, Abram was making that trade, right? He's trading his life having meaning, eternal meaning for right here, right now being rich. And I, I desperately don't want that for any of you. I want you to trade 
right here, right now, getting rich and famous and powerful and having no problems ever. I want you to trade all that for being more Christ-like in such a way that it impacts the entire world, that it impacts everyone around you, that you actually have meaning and purpose that fulfills you. And all you have to do in that is walk in and trust that that's what God has for you, that that's what He wants for you. To stop taking matters into your own hands and constantly figuring out the angle to fix your own problems. You know, and, and again, this doesn't mean, you you know, you got a bill to pay, you just sit on the couch and go, Lord, rain money. Like, <laughs> right? That, that's not it either, right? You have to act. I'm not taking that out of the equation, but you have to act in faith. You act on what God is showing you and leading you to do. You don't just, you know, we do this thing where we run forward and we hope God catches up. Like, no. The pillar of fire and smoke, right? We follow the pillar of fire and smoke. When it stays still, we stay still. When the pillar of fire and smoke moves, we move. That should be your whole life. That's what Abram Abram is learning right now. He got he got ahead of himself, got ahead of God, right? And God has to intervene to make it right. And thank goodness that God loves us enough to do that. Spend this week asking yourself, what's the thing that you're anxiety is tearing you up about because you have decided that God's redemptive grace isn't going to be involved. And give that up to the Lord. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of young adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and the sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.